Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you for being here. I uh, hope this week has felt shorter to the rest of you than it has me, but I know this is an exhausting, for some reason this exhausting week uh, has come to a close here. So we thank you for being here with us and with our uh, partners at Bricker and Eckler. This morning we have Laura Anthony talking for, uh, speaking on discipline and special education processes. This is our fourth installment for the 22-23 school year. Um, just a little bit logistically, um, Kyle, who is listed as interpreter Kyle, and Taylor, who is listed as ASL interpreter Taylor, are going to be providing um, sign language interpretation for today. So if you do need those services, um, please pin them to your um, to the top of your participant list. Uh, that way they are accessible for you. We will also go ahead and turn on the transcript for you so that that is available as well. Um, I do not have any other uh, announcements. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and Aaron and Kim or myself will do our best to relay those questions. Um, if Laura has any other preferences um, as far as receiving and answering questions, um, she'll let you know here in a second when I turn it over to her. But thank you for being here and um, we uh, know this will be a valuable time for you all. So if there's no other logistic questions, we will go ahead and turn it over to Laura. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, and thank you for all of you guys to join me on a Friday. <clears throat> Coming back, you, this is right before a holiday weekend for everybody, which I'm sure everybody's like, yes, it's our last holiday for a while. Um, and so I know that listening to a lawyer really you may not be on your list of to do your to-do list, but maybe as Stephen mentioned, coming back from break and coming back to the madness of the school year, listening to a lawyer is be better than being at your desk dealing with all the fires. I don't know. Maybe that's maybe, maybe this is better. And if it is, well, thank you. Thank, thanks for choosing this one. Um, for those who have not met me or haven't heard me present in the series before, um, I am the chair of the education practice group at Bricker and Eckler. We are a 30-person team that services and supports K-12 schools throughout the state of Ohio, as well as higher ed institutions, Ohio and nationwide. And we um, developed this series as a way to um, assist districts in training those who are new in leadership positions, special ed leadership positions, and then also provide a pipeline for those who may ascend to those kind of leadership positions. It is not meant to scare people away from leadership positions. It is more to, to provide support. And I have looked at the list of folks who are um, on the line and some of you I know, and I know that you've been in these types of positions for a long time and some of you I don't know. Um, so um, to those that I haven't met yet, welcome. Um, if you haven't heard me present before, my preference is to take questions throughout. I don't want to wait. I don't want you to have a question and, you know, be waiting and thinking I'm going to take a break because I just might not have time to take a break. Um, I'm going to try to push through. We have a pretty um, a aggressive agenda, an ambitious agenda. And um, so, you know, I'd prefer to take questions as they go. If I don't see the question, <clears throat> Steve or anybody else from the ESC or anybody is, you know, perfectly, uh, is perfectly acceptable to me to, you know, go off mute and, and ask the question um, if we're going with the flow. So let me give you an overview of what we're going to discuss today. I'm going to talk about the general rules that govern a discipline, that govern students with disabilities. Um, you know, everybody has these general rules that um, apply to them. And so uh, the then I will move towards talking about the specific rules, the super duper rules that govern students with disability, those special rules that govern special education. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a break um, so that you can get some emotional support or coffee or chocolate or your breakfast or whatever. I'm going to take a break in my voice and then we're going to come back. And what we're going to do is we will do one something that we've done for many years and people seem to like it. It is our mock manifestation review. 
You may have heard seen our mock reviews before. We've done them for IEPs. We have one for um, for uh, evaluations and doing eligibility. And this one is related to the manifestation review process. So with some volunteers from my office and some volunteers from the ESC, we are going to be, these are our volunteer thespians and they are going to act out a manifestation review. And during that process, we'll kind of um, highlight some areas that um, I discussed in this lecture portion. So hopefully our volunteer thespians are ready to ham it up because I know that you're gonna want to have a little bit more entertainment than just looking at me and looking at our beautiful slides. But I want to um, you know, kind of preview that for you. So um, the, we have a lot of cases. There are written materials. I believe the chat has the link to the written materials. You may have also received that in advance. There are a lot of cases in those materials. Why? Because that's what we do. We're lawyers. We read cases. Um, and that those cases help inform the advice that we provide. Um, and speaking of advice, today I'm not giving legal advice. So if you have a specific question about something that has occurred in your school district, um, that I would encourage you to talk to your legal counsel about that. And because this is a big public forum and I'm talking about general rules, even if I am somebody who works with your district, um, if you want to chat about a specific situation, we'll do that offline. But if you have general questions, don't hesitate to pop those in the chat. So again, the cases are in your materials. I will talk about some of them, but no, no way I could cover all of them and still get through the materials. All right. So that's kind of our overview, my disclaimer that I'm not providing legal advice and an introduction. Let me give you um, just some background and a, a framework for thinking about discipline in the context of education. And uh, before we move to the next slide, I wanna talk about the, di the differences between punishment and discipline, okay? This is a, kind of a philosophical framework that um, really is the basis for all of the things that you will see both in the world of special education and you know, in, in many, I would say more recent developments with respect to regular discipline. So what is the difference between discipline and punishment? And, and this as educators and as decision makers in terms of discipline, you should be thinking about that, this, um, both, both from a philosophical perspective and how you implement your procedures in your school districts. So punishment, you know, it is somebody does this and here is the response. It is a, you know, viewed as maybe a quick fix, like, <clears throat> you know, a reaction, but, you know, it is not, it is stopping maybe only the immediate behavior. It is focusing on the action and not the cause and typically will not result in any long-term changes in behavior. Now, discipline from a different perspective, you know, if you think about the origin of the word discipline, it comes from the root word of disciple, meaning teach, teaching. And so discipline is an approach to changing behavior through teaching, through evaluating the behavior, through planning to how are you going to teach something, a different kind of behavior. And, and it provides appropriate consequences for misconduct, but also results in longer term changes in behavior. So it isn't focused on <clears throat> what did you do on Thursday? It's looking at you know what is the origin of this behavior over time. And it, it provides a learning process that um, is intended to give skill, you know, have, build skills so that the student can um, maintain appropriate behavior. So, you know, it's the difference between a reaction and a response. Okay. And so what I want you guys to be thinking about in your districts are, what is my discipline response? Not it, what is my punishment reaction? And if what you think is on the books or what you think you are implementing may tip the scales a little bit on, in favor of a punishment reaction, you may find that that is not going to result in long-term changes in behavior. Now that's the, the discipline, rea the punishment reaction is quicker. <clears throat> it's easier. But if you, you know, the cumulative effect may not be as uh, meaningful. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
I'm going to get a drink and I'll let Steve advance the next slide. All right. <clears throat> I swear to God that is not a beer. Just showing you if you heard the opening of the can. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. What laws affect discipline? So not only do I'm am I looking at cases as a lawyer, I'm also looking at different laws that affect discipline. And there are a lot of them. <clears throat> there are some general principles that are articulated in a US Supreme Court case called Goss versus Lopez. So that that's the big big daddy kind of case out there about discipline. And um we but we also think about and here it is this is the the case. And you know it just happens to be from a case that originated in Columbus, Ohio, which is where I am right now. <clears throat> but in addition to Goss versus Lopez, there are, you know, you've got your IDEA, which is your federal law that governs students with disabilities. You have other federal statutes that talk about things like, you know, gun-free schools, um, other student conduct things like, you know, Title IX, um, you know, talking about discrimination. There are um, laws that deal with the records that you have for discipline both federal and state. And in addition, <clears throat> there are laws in Ohio that uh, we have to pay attention to. That's where I'm, I'm that's where I'm licensed. And so um, in Ohio, we have an entire statutory framework, 3313, which governs um, schools. And there's lots of laws in there that talk about discipline. So when we're looking and analyzing a case involving student discipline, we have to consider all of these laws. In addition, we're considering these general principles that come out of the cases. <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, in many of these cases, the courts will say, and I think I put this on the next slide, we are going to give discretion to schools to manage the discipline and student behavior in those school buildings. Most of the time, the courts will have a handoff approach, hands-off approach, which means they're not going to second guess. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> they are not going to second guess the uh, administrator's decision regarding what is or is not a violation of the code of conduct. Because the administrators are the ones with the boots on the ground. They're the ones who know students. They have the ability and experience in um, uh, working with students, understanding how to talk to students, understanding when students may not be providing credible information. And so they have a lot more experience with this than some, you know, than a judge might have. And so usually the courts will say, we're going to defer to your discretion. We're going to defer to um, what you've decided, unless, unless you haven't followed the laws that I just talked about. So these are the, this is the reason why following the procedures that are required in your board policies and that are required by the applicable laws, federal and state, help with the situation when it goes to court, because the court may not then come in and, and, and second guess, because sometimes they use that violation of a procedural rule as the way to open the door and um, second guess. So usually there's a lot of discretion afforded to schools. And so they're looking at not only the procedures, but they're also looking at what we call substantive due process. Now, due process is a term that you may have heard in special ed, but the constitutional due process is a very, is it something different? So in special ed, due process means um, <clears throat> a, a hearing. It's a due process hearing. It's a type of litigation that we have to challenge a decision in special education. Sometimes billeting administrators will talk about due process. I have to give them due process. And that's kind of aligned with what is required under the constitution. So what is required under the constitution is are three steps. The first step is notice. What conduct is prohibited? You're getting notice of that information. It's in your handbook, it's in your board policies, you have it posted in your school building. That is notice. Um, 
And the second is an opportunity to respond. So the opportunity to respond is going to look like, um, hey, yeah, I'm going to give you notice that I might it might suspend you for bringing this green leafy substance to the school. What do you have to say for yourself? Here's the little baggie, right? And the student says, you know, it wasn't mine. I don't know how it got there. It's oregano for the pizza party that we're having in home ec, whatever it is, they're responding. So that's notice, an opportunity to respond. And then the third element is after the principal hears, oh, that's this green leafy substance is, you know, wasn't mine. I don't believe you or whatever, you know, you have other indication that it is theirs. Then the, the principal will say, well, no, you are suspended. And then the third element is you have a right to appeal. You have a right to appeal to the Board of Education or to the board's designee. So that's notice, can't bring marijuana to school, an opportunity to respond, it wasn't mine. No, number three, you have a right to appeal my decision. And that's where we get this constitutional due process. Now, there's some elements there that we should be considering about in terms of each, each piece. So under the notice provision and all of this, everything I'm talking about is in your written materials. So the notice provision talks about in the, in the materials, you know, how specific do you need to be in your codes of conduct? Well, you need to be specific enough for individuals to understand what conduct is prohibited. You know, the school can impose disciplinary sanctions for a wide range of, you know, disruptive behavior. And, but, you know, it doesn't have to be, well, you can't bring this object and this object and this object. You can have a, a, a general description of an object. You know, you can't bring um, a, a pocket knife. You can't bring a steak knife. You can't bring a machete. You can't bring, you know, listing every type of instrument. Or you can say you cannot bring an instrument with a blade that is designed for cutting and, a, you know, a blade of so much, in, you know, sharpened blade. You can say something like that. Um, and when a rule is vague or overbroad, that is when it might not satisfy the notice provision. So, for example, if you have a dress code and you say, you know, inappropriate dress will not be tolerated. Well, that's kind of vague, you know. So being very specific about what type of dress will not be tolerated. And then it you you have to have rules that are school related. They need to be rationally related to the school's purpose. Now you can, there is the ab the ability if it that it might be related to the school's purpose, even if it is off campus. So off campus misconduct could be something that the school um, it, you know, it takes control over or, or issues discipline for, um, and your board policy is going to dictate the rules about that. So school may discipline students who engage in off-campus misconduct. Our state law allows that, but the board has to have a policy and has to, there has to be some relationship between school activities for you to have authority off, over off-campus misconduct. All right, I see that I have some questions. So I'm going to, are there some things in the chat? Will you be emailing the video presentation later for us to be able to refer back to? I will let Steve answer that question because I'm just here to talk. Um, <clears throat> logistics, I'll let, I'll let Steve answer that. All right, so I talked about notice that it can't be overbroad or vague, has to be somewhat specific, an opportunity to be heard. That is that opportunity to be heard increases as the consequences increase. So, you know, if it's something like a, a three day suspension, it could be very similar to what I just talked about. Here's notice of the intent to suspend. I intend to suspend you for this. What do you have to say for yourself? It wasn't me. It's not my, it's not my bag of green leafy stuff. And then, then the student is suspended and there's an appeal. Or if it's a more significant type of discipline, meaning it is an expulsion, there is another type of opportunity to be heard, and that is an opportunity in front of the, uh, the um, superintendent or designee. So understand that as the disciplinary consequences increase, so does so do the opportunities to, to respond and, and, and related appeal rights. All right. We are going to move on to the next slide, which is talking about discrimination. So in addition to special rules that apply to students with disabilities for discipline, 
understand, and, and, and I'm going to talk about all those special rules, understand that there's also some implication for um, under Section 504 for disability discrimination. So students with disabilities are protected from discrimination under Section 504, and your district's 504 coordinator, you might call the civil rights coordinator, is responsible for being sensitive to these issues. So for example, if a student with a disability is engaged in misconduct, you need to ensure that um, you are not you're not discriminating against that student with a disability as part of your disciplinary practice. And so one way to do that would be to um, impose rules on students with disabilities that don't apply to non-disabled students, giving harsher penalties to students with disabilities than, than those given to their uh, peers without disabilities, making a, a disciplinary change in placement for a student with a disability because of behavior that is related to the student's disability. You know, that's, that's a, you know, uh, be, because of behavior that is a manifestation of the student's disability. Um, disciplining student with disability procedures that are uh, prohibited by the student's IEP or behavior plan. So discrimination can take some forms of conduct that the district does. So for example, I'll pick on Steve because he's, he's here. You know, if I'm having an epileptic seizure and I am on the floor and I, during that epileptic seizure, I kick Steve in the head because Steve's coming to help me. That, you know, that is, would we discipline that student, me, for assault on Steve? Well, technically, my, my kicking Steve in the head is going to violate the code of conduct. And technically, that would be something that could be subjected to discipline. But everybody probably is thinking to themselves, why would we do that? Because that behavior was caused by the disability. That's right. But also be thinking about that in the context of behavioral disabilities, disabilities that manifest through conduct, you know, and, and those things are protected. And so it's not just under the IDEA that you have to conduct a manifestation review. You also have to do that under Section 504. So even the kids who don't have a, uh, you know, any type of academic plan or things like that, a student who has epilepsy, a student who has diabetes, a student who has a bee sting allergy, a student who has ADHD, those students who are identified and protected under Section 504 are also protected from discrimination under Section 504 and require an evaluation um, to conduct a manifestation review. All righty. Um, in addition, I talked about the district's uh, responsibilities for, to not discriminate. Also, if students with disabilities are engaged in student conduct and um, maybe they're being harassed because of their disability or they are the harasser because they don't appropriately understand social cues, they have you know limited communication abilities and they are doing something that is uh, viewed as harassing another student, understand that your responsibility is to protect them. So if a student with, um, with a peanut allergy is being harassed by other students because they can't have the Halloween party because of the peanut allergy student, that is a potential for the Section 504 coordinator to, in, to step in. And so it's not gonna just be this general run of the mill bullying investigation. If somebody says something that sounds like I am being treated differently because of my disability, that is something that it does not, it, it has to be referred to the district's 504 coordinator and um, uh, investigated according to those procedures. All right, I'm looking for, oh, there you go. Those are, those are nothing I need to deal with. All right. So <clears throat> also students with disabilities can be, um, you know, the bullies. And if there is a student who has uh, social deficits, that might be something that needs to be addressed by the student's IEP team or 504 team. Okay, yeah. so, yes? Oh, I was gonna read you the question. Oh, yeah, I got it. I just had to put cool. the glasses on. What if a student has a documented diagnosis of ODD and has significant behavior results, behavior that results in discipline? Could the student parent appeal? Student and parent can always appeal. There is no prohibition on appealing any disciplinary consequence. And a diagnosis doesn't mean a disability. If the student is disabled under Section 504 of the IDEA, these these rules apply. So, um, you know, I, I, this person is asking about a diagnosis. 
Um, but again, we are looking at disability status and not diagnosis. And so the, the team is going to have to consider all of the needs that result from the student's uh, disability. And if that disability is an emotional disturbance, and the student is diagnosed with, you know, a laundry list of things, including ODD, the, the, that has to be considered by the, the team before, in, in, you know, in, in con, under the 504 standard and the IDEA standard, if the students are also identified as a student with a disability under the IDEA. Okay. So we've talked, I, I've tried to give you a pretty comprehensive framework for regular ed discipline. And we're gonna move into the world of special education discipline. But before I do, I'm going to take a drink and have a pause. Does anybody have questions about regular ed discipline before we get into the next slide? Looks like no. All right. Now, the next slide, I believe, make sure I'm on track, is, yes, there we are, discipline under the IDEA. So oftentimes I'm asked, can we just put this in a flow chart? Because we need to make it easy for our building administrators. They've got a lot of other things to do, and special ed discipline is not their forte. They are, um, they need something that is easy. So they can work through the process. Can you do a flow chart? And the answer is yes, you can, but it's really not a very helpful flow chart because there are so many if thens and buts. And you know, we did a flow chart a couple many years ago, maybe more than 10 years ago, I think it was. And um, you know, it was like five pages long, you know, arrows going this way, and you know, it it's not flow chartable. The Ohio Department of Education put a flow chart up once. I don't know if it's still up there. Um, but at one time there was a flow chart that they created and uh, spoiler alert, I think there were some omissions in that. I don't think it was comprehensive. So I'm not sure if it's still up there. Somebody chime in if you know the answer to that. But in any event, um, this process is really not flow chartable. So instead, I'm going to give you a different kind of framework to work to to think about these questions. And under this framework, which I you know suggest that you consider, using for each uh, you know discipline scenario is you start with four questions and I'm going to walk you through that framework in just a bit um, but I think if you look at this from a four question analysis you will not be drawn to the desire to have a flow chart so under the IDEA understand that the U.S. Department of Education their, their philosophy is one very similar to what I described at the beginning of my comments. Their philosophy is this approach needs to be a discipline response to managing student behavior and not a punishing reaction to student behavior. So, you know, they have created these rules for the population of students with disabilities to ensure that districts are having this balanced approach. And this the, what you have to balance in this approach is that all students, including students with disabilities, deserve to be educated in safe and you know, orderly learning environments. And that teachers and school administrators need to have the tools and the resources to prevent misconduct and discipline and discipline student and, and address problems when they arise. Um, and so there has to be this balancing of the student's rights to education with the need to have safe and secure schools. And um, so to, to get to that balance, the discipline response is one that is intended to teach students how to manage their behavior. And when the IDEA rules were issued in 1997, um, you know, one of the iterations of the rules. There was a nice little quote that the U.S. Department of Education um, talked about that kind of just encapsulates this philosophy. So I'm just going to read it to you. And it says, cutting off children 
from a uh, cutting off children with disabilities from educational services is not an effective punishment. There we go, the punishment word. Instead, providing these students an effective alternative program increases their chances of becoming productive law abiding members of their communities. We believe that continued services are essential to ensure that disabled students who are subjected to disciplinary exclusions from school do not fall further behind and are able to gain their behavior, gain the behavior once they return to school. So this is the philosophy that we want to make sure that students have the right teaching in order to maintain appropriate behavior. And when the law was reauthorized in 2004, Congress did make several changes and expanded the authority of school officials to protect safety while balancing the rights and protections of students with disabilities. And now here we are in 2023. Um, definitely thought we'd have new rules in, in effect for special ed, but maybe that will happen. Um, there are some things coming down the pike from the feds. And, you know, in 2004, we didn't have as many school, as much of a school safety focus, although we had some. But, you know, I, I wonder whether or not when we see the new rules in, 2000, in 2029, I don't know when we're going to have new rules, but when we do have new rules, will we see further discussion of this, given all the attention and um, heartbreak that has been happening with respect to uh, student violence and and violence in the in the schools. So, you know, stay tuned to that. But right now our rules are really about a balancing approach. And the balance on the side of the student exists, it, it originates, the right originates from the FAPE standard. And so the law requires under the FAPE standard that all students um that, that, that FAPE, free and appropriate public education is available to all children with disabilities residing in, you know, in the, in the state between the ages of three and 21. And then it says, including children with disabilities who have been suspended or expelled. So that FAPE standard talks about, you can't just wash your hands of students who have been, who, you know, removed for disciplinary reasons. So the, the school does not need to provide services to a child with a disability who's been removed for less for 10 days or less if the school doesn't provide services to children who are not disabled um, who have been removed in a similar way. So that's the, the FAPE standard is where it all starts. And the law encourages what we call proactive approach to managing student behavior by emphasizing, and I think it's on, this is on the next slide, positive behavioral intervention supports. Um, you know, we were doing our functional behavioral assessments, we we're doing our behavior plans, and those that's where you get this, um, the proactive approach by analyzing, by planning for, um, by, by convening teams and talking about teaching behaviors, that is your proactive approach. And, you know, through your IEP, you're required to include services that are designed to address any behavior of that student that interferes with their learning or the learning of others. So it's not just your behavior assessments and your behavior plans that reflect your proactive approach. It is also your IEPs. So when we think about um, those IEPs, know that you know there isn't any you know special certification or special training that that districts need in order to do FBAs or behavior plans but it is helpful to have those with um, expertise in this area to have to consult with and so here's just a little plug for the, the ESC of Central Ohio has an SOS team and they can provide support um, to districts who may not have in-house support for uh, behavior. And there are other ESCs and other um, entities around the state that can also provide that type of support. But so so know that, um, you know, that that is out there and that can help you with your proactive approach. I, I you know, that there was a whole wave. There's kind of like, what is the issue of the day? Um, I've been doing this work for over 25 years. And 
um, you know, you see, you see different waves and, you know, there was a wave of autism and there has, has been a wave of, you know, dyslexia. Um, there was a wave of hearing impairment kind of focused, uh, you know, just a lot of advocacy and just, and now, and, and I would say for the past, you know, several years, this wave is about behaviors, which is the reason why you're seeing so many people, you know, ask for specific like board certified behavior analysts, ask not just for a student to have an aid, but to, to have an aid that is a registered behavior technician. Um, and so districts are need, you know, need to respond to that because we are in a situation where, you know, students, staff, everybody, just like, you know, Stephen mentioned at the beginning of the, of the hour, we're a little on edge, right? And so more behavior support is is a good thing. Um, and there are people out there who have developed this as their business. And, and you know, for districts to outsource that is becoming quite expensive. And so districts are leaning into this need and often developing their own talent and their own expertise internally. And, and I encourage you to do that if you, if you can. All right. Um, <clears throat> functional behavioral assessments. Let's talk about that a little bit. Functional behavioral assessments. It really isn't a, 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 a um, mandated process federally, but we do have our optional forms in the state of Ohio that walk you through the process. But the basic gist of it is that you're identifying the problematic behavior. You're observing, observing the student in various settings. You are collecting data. Um, you know, what are the, what are the antecedents? What are the consequences? You're developing a hypothesis hypothesis about the cause of the behavior and then you're you know working to test that hypothesis and then you're collecting you know if that hypothesis isn't the right one you're collecting additional data and you're convening as a team to talk about your conclusions so when is this functional behavioral assessment appropriate anytime okay anytime it's appropriate to do that when is it actually legally required when you engage when there is proposed discipline that is a change of placement and we'll talk about what that means when we get to our framework um in addition there's no, again no qualif specific qualifications to conduct an f functional behavioral assessment and there's some language out there um some, sometimes there's a little bit conflicting language but i would say if somebody is disagreeing with the district's functional behavioral assessment you know there may be a request and the parent disagrees with that, there may be a request for a uh, independent. Let's talk about the behavior plan really quickly. Behavior plan really needs to have what I call uh, five Ps. I'm sorry, four Ps, four Ps of the BIP. So it has to be proactive. Okay, that's the first P. You gotta be, have a proactive approach. Um, it shouldn't be a list of consequences, right? That's reactive. Um, it should be positive. Remember, what is the dif difference between discipline and punishment? Behavior intervention should not be punitive. They should emphasize positive approaches. You've got to be persistent. That's our fourth P. Um, you know, and be persistent in updating the plan when necessary. That's it's not a static document. And then the fourth P is a plan. You got to actually have a plan. It has to be written plan. It's not a one size fits all approach. Like we're going to have a. Um, you know, a clip on a clothesline and we're going to move it from red to green or green to red. Um, that's that's not an, a, an individualized plan. So those are things to be thinking about for your uh, behavior plans. And, you know, you, you have to be thinking about this proactive approach, not just for the behaviors that are going to be you know, disruptive in your class, like student um, is, you know, yelling in the class or eloping from the school or cutting class. It's also those internalizing behaviors that interfere with that student's learning. So they're shutting down. They're not engaging in school. They're not coming to school. They are, um, maybe they're interacting inappropriately with peers. So all of those, it's any time that behavior prevents the student from making progress, even if it's not, you know, a, a big behavior. All right, let's move on to our next slide. I'm not going to cover restraint and seclusion. I could really talk about this for a long time. And given that, you know, the limited amount of time today, I, I don't want to you know, go down the rabbit hole of restraint and seclusion, other than to say that you have a policy, your district has to have a policy regarding restraint and seclusion. Make sure that if those who are 
handling student conduct, have a really good um, understanding of what is required with respect to your restraint and seclusion protocols, what documentation is necessary, what notifications are necessary, what consultation may be necessary, and what logistics you have to follow in order to um, make sure that you that the district maintains compliance. An interesting thing about restraint and seclusion is that those these standards apply across the board, not just to students with disabilities. And there are some things in the restraint and seclusion rules that look like very similar rules to what we are talking about in special ed, like a functional behavioral assessment and plans. So, um, you know, if that is if this is not something on your radar, I encourage you to take a deep dive into your board's policy and be thinking about how it aligns with your special education procedures. All right. Um, let's talk about, I believe, section five. Oh, here's our framework for analysis. Okay, this is what we're going to get into. This is our four question framework that we're going to go through to talk about special education discipline. And after we get through this is when we will we will take a break. So um, I'm going to pause for my voice. Any questions before we move on? All right. I've made it crystal clear. Or you're online shopping or doing something else or answering emails. <laughs> All right. So the, the framework that we have, as I mentioned earlier, starts with asking four questions and I'll go through them really quickly and then we will go through them individually. So the four questions are, number one, is the student currently identified as a child with a disability? Number two, if they're not currently identified as a child with a disability, should they? Is there a child find issue? Number three, what are we proposing as discipline? Is it gonna be something that is not gonna remove a student from their behavior, from their educational environment? Or is it something really big? Like they're gonna be expelled. So that's number three. three. And number four is, is there some special circumstance involving student safety? So those are your four questions, okay? And now we're gonna go through them one by one. These four questions will get you to the answer that you need to, that you have in terms of what are your options in managing that student's behavior. All right, number one. Is the current is the student currently identified as a child with a disability? This may be easy. It may not be easy. So you know you're going to ask: Does the student have an IEP? And we evaluated the student and determined that the child is an it should be identified as a child with a disability. And and keep in mind, if I should I should have already said this that um, what I'm talking about right now, this framework is the IDEA framework. This is the students with IEPs framework, okay? So Section 504 is a little bit different. And I believe we have already covered 504 in this series. I think it may it might have been last month, but we do a whole section on 504. Correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, I can't remember. So I'm, I'm covering IEP world. Um, and so, the first question is, is the child currently identified on an IEP? Okay, easy, yes or no. So that's your first question. If the answer is yes, we're gonna move on to question three. If the answer is no, we're moving on to question two, which is, if they're not, should they be considered a child with a suspected disability? Meaning we had some suspicion before the child did what they did, before the, the conduct issue, we had some suspicion, we meaning the school, that the child might be a child with a disability. Now, this is the one that is the most difficult to think about because we may have had a suspicion in third grade, and now we're dealing with an 11th grader. So whenever I get a call about a discipline situation and I'm going through these four questions, usually the person on the other end of the line cannot answer that question. You know, did we ever suspect a disability? Did we ever get information that should have led us to suspect a disability? 
sometimes that's going to involve looking back historically to a couple of different triggering events. Now, usually if you've heard my presentation about this before, um, I always use the scenario of the Willy Wonka golden ticket. Um, and, and I do that because number one, I love movies from the 80s. I love the Gene Wilder version. I love the whole thing. In fact, last year I was Willy Wonka for, for Halloween. So fun fact. So I have a Willy Wonka costume in my office. So um, know that in this Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, in, in the um, scene, the one scene, and if you remember it, you will know, you'll remember this part because I think it's a pivotal scene in the movie where Gene Wilder is standing in front of the door before he lets all the students in to this land of chocolate rivers and lollipop trees and, you know, gumdrop benches. And he said, and all of them have, I will have my prop, my post-it note, here we go. They all have their Willy Wonka golden ticket, right? They're about to go into the door and they've got the ticket to be able to go through that door. And the, the question is, is Gene Wilder gonna open that door because they've got the golden ticket? And he gives them this, this, you know, don't touch anything, right? Don't touch anything, don't eat anything, right? And of course they don't listen to him and all, you know, everything happens for the rest of the movie because they don't listen to him. So this is kind of about student behavior, right? Like he's telling them the rules and you can't go through the door. However, these kids who have the Willy Wonka golden ticket, they have some special protections, right? And I want you to be thinking about when we're asking the question, are these students considered to be a suspected disabled student? They might have the golden ticket, but we don't know about it, right? We don't have an IEP to, to show us that. And they might have gotten the golden ticket back in third grade, and now you have an 11th grader. So you have to ask the question, these, these questions, did they get the golden ticket? And so I say that there's three ways that you open that door because you've got the golden ticket, right? There's three ways to get that. And the first way is if the parent expresses concern in writing, could be an email, and all of this is in your materials, okay? The parent of the child expresses concern in writing that the child is in need of special education and related services. Now, they don't have to write those magic words. They can say something like, you know, I have, you know, another, you know, my older son has an, an IEP and I'm just wondering whether or not, you know, my younger son is, you know, exhibiting some of the same behaviors um, you know, is there some tutoring? Are there some su supports? Could be as innocuous as that. But if the parent expresses concern in writing to the teacher of the child or to a, an administrator that the child might need special education related services, they've got the golden ticket. If they got that in third grade, they might still have it. Okay, that's the first way they get the golden ticket. The second way that they get the golden ticket is if the parent requests an evaluation of the child, does not need to be in writing. Okay, parent might request an evaluation of the child. Think about that. That could occur at a parent teacher conference. Okay, so, you know, here are two situations where the teacher, maybe the teacher gets an email or the teacher gets a request verbally at a parent teacher conference and lo and behold that student has the golden ticket. And so in the 11th grade we're going to ask the question, you know, did the parent ever express concern in writing that the child might need special ed? Did the parent ever request an evaluation? We might have to do some digging back to 3rd grade to figure that out. Okay, so I told you there were three ways to open the door. Two of the ways are the parent initiates that. But the third way is the school is giving them the golden ticket because the teacher of the child or other district personnel express a specific concern about the student's pattern of behavior. And they are expressing that concern to the director of special ed or other supervisor, so another administrator. So it is not just the lunch lady is expressing concern to this bus driver. It's somebody is expressing concern to somebody who can do something about it. Okay. And so th that could really happen at an IAT meeting or some other meeting to talk about the student's behavior. 
And if that happens, that student has the golden ticket. That student has the ability to, to be determined a suspected disabled child and be entitled to all of these protections, okay? So I told you that there were three ways to close, open the door. There are also three ways to close the door. All right, so I see a question. I'm gonna pause and look at that. So a teacher or parent referral for their student to go through the RTI process is a clear example of a golden ticket, correct? correct? Well, if the teacher, so let's talk about the parent. The parent is requesting an evaluation. The answer is golden ticket. If the teacher is referring the student to go through the RTI process for a reason other than behavior, no golden ticket, because the teacher has to express concern about the student's pattern of behavior. If the teacher is expressing concern about the student's reading fluency or you know, math skills or attention, that is, you know, or, or, or something, not, maybe not attention, something unrelated to behavior, then that would not be the golden ticket, okay? So three ways to open the door and three ways to close the door. The way that you close the door is that if somebody's got the golden ticket and the, the district says, oh, I see you've got the golden ticket. There's been a request for services. There's been a request for an evaluation. There's been a suggestion through the RTI, or RTI process about a pattern of behavior parent, we would like to evaluate your child. And there's a request to evaluate. And the parent says, I will not consent to an evaluation in writing. That closes the door. Okay, we're done. And you're going to need to propose an evaluation through your process, your prior written notice, all of the things, and get the parent refused to allow the evaluation of the child. That closes the door. Because how can the child be suspected disabled if the parent won't allow us to evaluate? It makes sense. So that's the first way you close the door. The second way that you close the door is that you go through the, you know, you propose an evaluation, you um, conduct the evaluation, and you determine that the child is eligible for special education services, and you propose an IEP, and the parent says, I decline right? They, they refuse services. That will close the door. That's the second way. And then the third way that the school can close the door is to do all that process. You propose the evaluation, you issue prior written notice, you conduct the evaluation, you meet as a team, and the team determines that the student is not eligible under the IDEA, and you provide prior written notice of that. So you go through the entire process and you find does not qualify and that closes the door. See, I have a question. If we propose an evaluation, the parent does not respond after many attempts. So there is that provision in, in the Ohio operating standards that allows for the district to proceed with an evaluation. I have to look it up. Is that an initial? Hmm. I'm gonna look it up or maybe, maybe Kristen will look it up for me or somebody, but I, there is that one that parent does not, I will look it up during the break that, that the parent doesn't respond. I can't remember if that's an initial or not. Um, so one of the ways that, we, and one of the things that we talk about here, and I, and I believe I talked about this in the, the session that I did um, for uh, Child Find, so one of the things that you in, you know, that the, the operating standards allow for, the operating standards allow for the school to say, oh, I know you, you're requesting an evaluation, um, but we don't suspect a disability. So you know that once you get a referral for an evaluation, the school district has 30 days to do one of two things. They can either... Um, obtain, they need to either obtain consent to move forward with an evaluation, or they need to issue a prior written notice that says, we are not going to evaluate. We are not going to, we don't suspect a disability. We are not going to evaluate. Okay. So you're allowed to do that. Guess what happens to the golden ticket? It's in their back pocket. Okay. It does this, this scenario of we are not going to evaluate does not get rid of the golden ticket. The student still has it. So if, um, 
So if there is a uh, request and we respond to that request by saying we are not going to evaluate, we still have the door being opened for that student to be considered to be a child with a suspected disability. Okay. So that's how the interplay between child find and uh, discipline works because, uh, and, and that exists even if the suspect, the suspicion was an academic disability. Okay. There's no, there's no limitation on, on that. So Steve, I believe has found, is the golden ticket still in the back? See, I love it now. Everybody's going to adopt this golden ticket philosophy. Is the golden ticket still in the back pocket if the team determines the child is not eligible? No, that is the third way that we get rid of it. We get rid of the golden ticket, right? We, the parent refuses consent for the evaluation. The parent refuses services, or we do an evaluation. We determine that the child is not eligible and we issue that decision. We issue prior written notice. The golden ticket is no longer there. Now, doesn't mean that the parent can't reassert later that, okay, you did this evaluation. You didn't find my child eligible. Now we're in the 11th grade. There's some new diagnoses, okay? You know, kids needs change over time and you may have to conduct another evaluation. All right, but before we move on, um, operating standards consent override. So got my little handy dandy operating standards because, you know, you just don't go anywhere without them. Oh, um, Steve's pa pagination is different than mine. So I will look at a, I will look at it when I um, have a break. All right. So do we all get it? We all get that we, the first question we're asking is, is the child identified as a student with a disability? Yes or no, right? Do they have an IEP? Yes or no. And the second question is, if no, should they be considered as a student with a suspected disability? Yes or no. Okay, that those are your questions. Now we're moving on to question number three. Oh, so the golden ticket applies to behavior only if we don't suspect a disability. No, the golden ticket is always there unless you get rid of it through those three ways. Okay, doesn't matter if you're if there's a maybe the parent is suspecting a disability, uh, you know, and asks for an evaluation of reading, and we say we're not going to do it the student still has the golden ticket. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I answered all the questions. Now, what if the parent during this process requests an evaluation? Maybe you didn't suspect a disability. Maybe there was no golden ticket in the back pocket before the student engaged in the conduct. There's no suspicion. What if during this process, the parent says, now I'd like to an evaluation. If that happens, the rules provide that you have to do the evaluation in an expedited manner, which is less than 60 days, okay? So that you can still move forward, but you have to, if there was no, absolutely no, nada, no knowledge prior to the discipline between the, before the conduct, of this suspected disability. While that evaluation is being completed, and again, it's done in an expedited manner, the student can be in the placement that is determined by the school authorities, and that could be suspension or expulsion. Okay, now we are moving on to question number three. Question number three is, what is the nature of the intended disciplinary consequence? You know, is it a short-term removal? Is it a long-term removal? It is, is it a change of placement? So after the school determines that the student is protected, right, because they either have an IEP or they're suspected disabled, now we're moving on to looking at the nature of the, the, the discipline. And so you have to think about, is this a, a consequence, a discipline that doesn't re result in any removal from school? Is it, you know, an in-school suspension? Is it a, um, a, you know, Wednesday school, after school? Is it a Saturday school? Is it a lunch detention? You know, is it something that is not removing the student from their educational services? If so, you're probably not going to go down into the next, you know, road because those are, this is really this conversation and this framework is for disciplinary removals. So let's talk about in-school suspension. While the student may not be removed from school, they might be removed from their educational program. And so that in-school suspension is going to 
you know, the question is, is it, does that count as a disciplinary removal? And the answer is going to depend on what's happening in in-school suspension. Does the student have an opportunity to progress in general education in their curriculum while they're in in-school suspension? Do, is the student receiving all of their IEP services? Yes or no? I mean, it, it, is the student continuing to participate with non-disabled students to the same extent as they had been participating in, you know, before they were disciplined? So you're looking at, are you segregating all of the students with disabilities in one in-school suspension room and they're not participating with non-disabled peers? So, you know, have a, a thoughtful ex exploration of what's happening in in-school suspension, particularly with the um, educational services. Are they getting um, instruction from an intervention specialist? Are they getting their related services? Are they getting their, you know, all of the things that are required by their IEP? If the answer to that is no, then that in-school suspension is going to count as a day of removal. Even though the student is physically on the property of the school district, if they're removed from their services, then that's going to be a discipline and it's going to count as, as part of your days. Now, remember when we talked about FAPE, we said these are, you know, these rules, you can remove a student from their program for 10 days or less. So now we're getting into the business of counting days. So how many days were they in in-school sus suspension or in-school removal? And how many days did they not get their services? We're counting up the days. What about the bus suspension? If somebody is removed from the bus, what happens then? If a student is not, if a student has special transportation on their IEP, the bus suspension is going to count because transportation is a related services, is a related service. So you're looking, is the student being removed from their, the services that they are entitled to on their IEP. And if transportation is determined to be a disability related need, meaning they can't access, you know, can't get to school safely because of their disability, then those days of removal from the bus are gonna count, okay? Um, other disciplinary consequences, you know, being in a study carol, being having a detention, having Saturday school, those things are not going to be a removal. Okay, so you're looking at what is the nature of the disciplinary consequence, and if it's not a removal, we're not having to do some of the things I'm going to talk about, like manifestation reviews and things like that. If it's 10 days or less, so we're getting into the kind of lower level removals, then you have to know that the student is not entitled to services during those 10 days or less, unless you're giving services to other, all the other students, the students do that do, are not identified as individuals with disabilities. If those, in, that those students do not get services in 10 days or less, then the students who are identified as children with disabilities, they, they you, know, you have to be, treat them the same. So if regular ed students don't receive educational services, there's nothing for the school district to do other than to count days and to be proactive, okay? Well, when you're counting days, know that in the um, 2007 regulations, the Department of Education said that portions of a day that the child has been suspended may be considered a removal for determining whether there's a pattern. So you may be, you know, if the student is sent out for a part of the day, that might count as a full day of removal. So what do you do in 10 days or less? 10 days or less, you continue to provide educational services consistent with non-disabled students. And you are proactive because when you start reaching, you know, eight, nine, 10 cumulative days, you might be in a situation where you're gonna go over the 10 day mark. And once you go over the 10 day mark, then we're in a different category. So we're looking at 10 days or less, easy peasy. You might get 11, 12, 13 days, and now you have to think about, is this a change of placement, okay? Once you pass that 10-day mark as a total in a school year, your next question is, are we considering, what is the nature of the intended disciplinary consequence? Is what we're considering constituting a change in placement, okay? Once you pass the 10 day threshold, the student is entitled to services. There are always going to be services on day 11. Those services need to be designed to um, enable the student to progress in their general education curriculum and receive their IEP services. So we pass that 10 day mark on day 11. 
to quote another movie from the 80s, I think it was, we're turning it up to 11. That's from Spinal Tap. So when we turn it up to 11, services are required for the student. So, but if we get 11 and it's a change in placement, then we have other duties. Okay. So who determines what services are provided on day 11? If we're not, if it's not a change of placement, the, stu the school can determine those services. So the school in consultation with the student's teacher determines the services that are necessary. If we've turned it up to 11 and the, and the removal constitutes a change of placement, which I'll talk about, then the IEP team has to convene and determine the services. Okay, so now we're into, you know, as we turn it up even higher and higher, it's more and more process. So that it's 11, it's not a change of placement, the teacher determines the services. Now we're getting a little bit farther and it's gonna be a change in placement. We actually have to convene an IEP team meeting. Now, when I said the services have to be, um, you know, the general ed curriculum and the IEP services, you know, know that sometimes you got to get creative in terms of the general ed, you know, if the student is in an auto tech program, or in a sophisticated chemistry lab, does that mean you're sending home microscopes and, um, you know, carburetors? No, but so you got to, you got to be a little bit creative on how can they um, continue to progress in their general education services. The team has to determine um, the least restrictive environment when you're thinking about those uh, day 11 services. So a lot of considerations to, that, that come into play. All right, so we're gonna, we talked about turning it up. Day 11, you get services, and now you're having to figure out what about, when does this become a change of placement? Because once it becomes a change of placement, a couple things happen. It's not until and unless the conduct is a change of placement that you have to convene an IEP team to do the manifestation review. So everything I've talked about up until now, you don't have to go down the road of manifestation reviews until you've turned it up to 11 and determined that the student's placement, there's a change of placement being proposed. So a lot of districts, and I know you guys, I know there's a lot of you out there that are getting to this point before you have to get to this point. You're doing manifestation reviews, you're convening IEP teams at eight, nine, 10 days, maybe even 11, maybe even 12, where it's not a change of placement. I'm not gonna say you can't do that. I'm just gonna ask you to question, should you do that? Do you have, you don't have to do that. It's only when you get to the point of 11 and a change of placement that the manifestation review is required. And the manifestation review creates a lot of rights and a lot of process. And so question, query, should you be doing it before you have to, okay? So what, when do you have to? You have to do the manifestation review process when the removal is for more than 10 consecutive days. So that is 11 in a row. Okay. Or this child has been re subjected to a series of removals that constitute a pattern. And when you're looking at this pattern, it is more than 10 cumulative. So more than, so 11. And the child's behavior is substantially similar in all of these incidents. Okay. So the student may be, you know, eloping from the school and eloping from the classroom and, um, you know, what it all, so a couple of different scenarios, pattern of behavior is similar. And then you're also looking at, you know, were these three incidents of elopement all done um, between September and November? Or were they strung out for the, for the entire year so that there was you know, four days of suspension in September and four days of suspension in December and four days of suspension in April. So you're looking at the length of the amount of time and the proximity of the removals to one another. So this is a fact specific analysis. It is looking at the pattern of the student's behavior and the frequency and pattern of the student's removal. Okay. So 
it is not just 11 equals a change of placement. 11 in a row will equal a change of placement, but you could have a change of placement for multiple, you can have a student who's removed for multiple scenarios and it not be a change of placement. So I have a question, what would constitute a change of placement? So if you have, a, you know, just like I said, if you have a student who's, who's presenting with, um, you know, aggressive behaviors and you've got a pattern of removals and it's more than 11 and the student is, um, you know, a, you've got a three-day suspension, then you've got a five-day suspension, and then maybe you've got another five-day suspension. Now you've got 13 and they're all for similar, similar behavior, similar, you know, dysregulation types of behavior, that's going to be a change of placement. And once you hit that change of placement mark, that's when we start down, start, not end, start down the road of a manifestation review. Okay. Amanda, does that answer your question? Hopefully. If it if it doesn't, ask me, ask me again. Okay. All right. So um what does this mean? So this means that the minute, the day, whatever, the, the day that it is determined that the student's placement is going to be changed, then that starts the process for the manifestation review, which I think is our next slide. Yes. Okay. So how much time do you have to do this? Like what, do you have a time frame? Yes, you do. And the time frame is that the district must within 10 days of determining that a student's placement is going to be changed, okay? Within 10 school days of, this is exactly, within 10 school days of any decision to change placement, okay? We didn't, we didn't change placement on day four. We didn't change placement on day nine. We didn't change placement on day 10. We didn't change placement until the, the superintendent sent the letter that said, you are expelled. That's day one, okay? And you, you school district have 10 school days to convene the, mean, the meeting of the IEP team to determine the manifestation, okay? So a lot of districts, I know you're out there, you guys do the manifestation pr process before you ever reach 10. You can, but should you? Do you need to? No, the law allows you 10 days from the decision that it must take place within 10 school days of any decision to change placement of a child with a disability. So the manifestation determination is not required when the expulsion is being considered. Notice of intended expulsion. That's not you are expelled. The manifestation determination required is triggered on the date that the decision is made to implement a disciplinary removal that constitutes a change in placement. There, there is language in your materials that that specify this. So, you know, take a look. If you need ammunition to go to your district leadership to say, we don't have to do it before, it's in there, right? So what are you doing? All right, I have a question before I move on. A student fights gets 10 days for this incident. Next fight, we have 10 days to complete, should do or do it now. Student, well, the, my question is, is this the first student, if this, is this the first time the student is disciplined, removed for disciplinary reasons that year, okay? And if the answer is yes, then, then you don't have any, you don't have to do anything. The student is out for 10 days. We did not, nobody turned it up to 11. We have a second fight and the student is then suspended for another 10 days. The day that the student is, you are suspended, right? So now we know that the student has now been suspend is being suspended for a total of 20 days for the same behavior. On the day that that suspension notice goes out, the, the district has 10 school days to convene the manifestation review. So it's a shame that it's all tens, you know, because it gets confusing but you then have 10 days to look at, is there a manifest, is this be, is this fighting a manifestation of the child's disability? And when you're convening your manifestation review, who's coming to that party? Well, it's going to be 
um, mem relevant members of the IEP team. So individuals who might have information about that behavior and information that is about the student's disability. So somebody like the um, school psych might have some good information. Uh, question, so an emergency removal, does that count? All days count that the student is unilaterally removed from their educational program. So whether it's emergency removal, suspension, expulsion, I need a mental health break from your child day, you can call it whatever you want. If the student is unilaterally removed by the school district from their services, those days count. Okay. Uh, what information are we considered? I'm going to actually gloss over the manifestation review because we're going to act that out. If the behaviors are different, example, fighting on the first infraction, infraction but possession of drugs should be holding the manifestation after 11 days, it depends. You're going to be looking at, is this a pattern? So it may not be fighting, 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 but it might be fighting, um, use of profanity, um, running out of the classroom. And all of those are determined to be um, uh, emotional regulation issues, okay? So, you know, you have to determine as a team, is it a pattern? All right, so I'm gonna keep moving forward just because we are gonna show you this manifestation process. And we're gonna move to question number four. So we, we, we're gonna do the manifestation process. We'll show you how that look, what that looks like. But our fourth question and our last question is, did the misconduct um, concern some element of safety, some, some safety risk? And so, you know, you're looking at this safety circumstance because that gives you, even though they have the golden ticket, okay? Even though you've done the manifestation review, and then the and you know that the behavior is a manifestation of the child's disability. Okay. And because if you do the manifestation review and you determine that the child that the behavior is a manifestation of the child's disability, that student goes back to school, back to their placement. You can't just say, oh, it's a manifestation. And so we're going to put them on home instruction. No, no, no. In Ohio, that requires parental consent. If the behavior is a manifestation of the child's disability, they return to school. Unless the conduct concerns a, circ a special circumstance involving safety. So if you're in a situation where you're like, oh my goodness, we're gonna have to put this kid back in school, then you're gonna be asking this question, Does this mis the, is there a safety issue? And if there is a safety issue, and I'll talk about the, the uh, criteria for that, the student can be removed to an interim alternative educational setting for up to 45 school days re without regard to whether the behavior was a manifestation of the child's disability. So the safety exceptions are the student carries or possesses a weapon at school, and all of these are in your materials. Um, the weapon is defined as, um, you know, something that can that is designed to or readily capable of causing death or serious bodily injury, except that it doesn't include a knife of less than with a with a blade of less than two and a half inches. Okay, so you're you know if you, if you have knives, please 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 make sure that somebody's taking a picture of that or putting it on the photocopier and next to a ruler so that we know how big was the blade because if it's a small pocket knife, it's not going to be considered a safety exception. I'm not going to comment on that. And but if it's a big knife, it's if it's a machete, you know, it's going to be considered to be a weapon. So if if somebody brings a weapon to school that meets the definition of a weapon, and let's say they brought the weapon to school because they were hallucinating and they thought that their art teacher was going to abduct them, right? So and maybe it's a child with an emotional disturbance who experiences auditory hallucinations. So you're going to sit, you're, you know, we're thinking about expelling this kid or we've expelled this kid for, you know, 80 days and we're going to do the manifestation review. And we were like, yep, bringing that knife was a manifestation of the child's disability. It's not that the student goes back to school on day 11. It's that the student can be now removed for up to 45, for 45 school days because this is, they brought a weapon to school. And the same is true if they brought drugs to school. Okay. Well, and the and the same is true if they engage um, in serious bodily injury. 
Now, serious bodily injury is defined in your materials as not the run of the mill stuff that you guys probably see in schools. It involves, that is bodily injury that involves substantial risk of death, extreme physical pain. Like, did you go to the ER and did you rate your pain at a 10? Uh, protracted and obvious disfigurement where you was, was the you know person out of school for a long time because they had to have their jaw wired shut. Protracted loss or impairment of a function of a body member, organ, or mental faculty. They had a concussion that rendered them in, in, unable to you know, come back to school for a significant period of time. Okay, that's a lot. Serious bodily injury is what gets you over the threshold of special circumstance. Contrast this, and this, these are both in your materials, these, this definition of run of the mill, not so serious bodily injury, which is cuts, abrasions, bruises, burns, disfigurement, physical pain, illness, impairment of a function of body more member, organ, or mental faculty. That's not so serious bodily injury. Okay. And that's my hope is what you, you know, that you don't get into the realm of the serious bodily injury. But there are a lot of cases in your materials interpreting what constitutes serious bodily injury. And it's, you know, it's it's pretty darn serious. So if any of those special circumstances occur, then you can remove a student, even if the behavior is a manifestation of their disability. All right, I have a question or two. If behaviors are different, oh, I already answered it. Is a taser one that could be used in that scenario? Um, I guess the question is, is, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of experience with tasers, but could the taser, uh, where's my definition? Could the taser result in um, death or serious bodily injury? I don't know. I would, you know, I would, I'd err on the side of putting it out there because it's pretty dangerous. Um, what if the alternative setting doesn't accept students younger than ninth grade, but the conduct falls under the special circumstance? Um, what if the alternative, so meaning the interim alternative educational setting doesn't accept students? Sorry about your luck. You still have to provide interim alternative educational settings. So the district's going to have to get creative. The options are going, you know, going to be whatever the IEP team decides are appropriate. You can't just have a one size fits all. And there are, there are programs that aren't um, going to accept students who, you know, engage in, in, in that kind of behavior. Um, what if the parent refuses a change of placement? So if the parent refuses a change of placement in regular world, like regular special ed world, then in Ohio, you cannot change placement unless, it, but if we're in the discipline context, if we're in the discipline context, you can change a student's, you can do, you can, you can implement a disciplinary change of placement, which is a different animal. This is removing a student from services because of discipline. Um, in the discipline context, if the behavior is not a manifestation of the child's disability, you're going to move forward with that disciplinary change of placement. And if the behavior is, um, is a manifestation of the child's disability, then you can only change the child's placement if it's a special circumstance involving safety or, and this is on our next slide, so this is somewhat a good caveat, or in a hearing, you can go, I think the next slide, yeah, you can have, you can request a hearing from a court or from a special ed hearing officer to try to change the child's placement over the objection of the parent. So can't do it unilaterally. Um, in Ohio. All right. I think that is the last slide. What's the next slide? Is this referral to, okay. So law enforcement, you know, maybe you may need to contact law enforcement if there's a situation involving student conduct. And in the situ in that type of situation, uh, law enforcement may be necessary to deal with some sort of, you know, drug possession or weapon possession or things like that. But make sure that you understand that when you refer students who are identified as disabled um, to law enforcement, you need to make sure that you tell them that the student is identified as a child with a disability. And that can either be done with the consent of the parent or with the, um, um, you know, a subpoena or things like that. 
All right, so it is almost 1030. We are going to take a 10 minute break. Um, so we will return at 1040 and we will at that point be doing our mock manifestation review. Um, so I would ask that the um, volunteer thespians that we have from the ESC um, or at the, the SST to uh, get your scripts ready and we will see you at 1040. People are trickling back in. As people are trickling back in, we're going to have some volunteer actors, and so I would ask for those volunteers to put their um, to put their uh, cameras on, so we can see your method acting. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six. Two, three, four, five. We have one more. Oh, I think it's me. We have one more ESC person we're waiting for, I think. I oh, think no. they just asked for two of us. Okay, so it's Stephen and you, Aaron? Yep. yep. All right. Welcome to the, your opportunity for an Academy Award. So this is something that we have done before. We usually have more time to do it, but because you guys are such an engaged audience, we are going to try to compress this into our, oh, what do we have? We've got 50 minutes. We can do it. No worries. I'm going to be playing one of the roles, um, but we also have um, other volunteers from our Bricker and Eckler team. We have Kristen Porter, who is the mastermind behind all of the materials that you received. So if you like the materials and the graphics, Kristen is responsible for that. Yay. Kristen is going to be playing the role of the parent, Miss Simpson. Erin Heydrich, another attorney on our special education team, is going to be the playing the role of our special education director, Ms. Moneypenny. Isaac Orlansky, another attorney in, on our team who um, comes to us from Cincinnati. Well, by way of New York City. <laughs> um, he is going to be playing Principal Rooney. Now, for those of you who are serving as principals, I'm going to apologize because Principal Rooney is determined, is, is in our scenario to be the, the fall guy. He's going to do everything wrong. So it doesn't mean that we have any bias against principals. It's just we needed somebody for the comic relief, and that is Principal Rooney, named after, back to the 80s movies, the principal in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Um, and then we have uh, Aaron Curtis. I think you're playing Basque or... No, no, I'm doing Miss Ice. You are doing Miss Ice. Okay. So Aaron is playing the role of Miss Ice, our intervention specialist extraordinaire. That's I S E. And then we have, is it Judy or Stephen doing the other? That's me. Okay. And Stephen is going to be playing the role of Basque, the um the um special, the uh school psychologist. All right. And I'm going to be playing or is Judy playing or no I see Judy it's you Laura okay I saw another face on the screen so I'm like okay do I get out of it I out of playing the role of smiley no I will be smiley the regular education teacher so um our dramatization our our scenario takes place in a conference room in Pleasantville High School which is located in Pleasantville School District a medium-sized district located in a rural area. And they've had a number of teachers retire, so they're often short-staffed. Yeah, is that like currently today, everybody is short-staffed. And our meeting takes place in May. We've got two siblings who are the subject of our meeting. It's Jack and Jill Simpson. They've both been recommended for expulsion. Jack is a 17-year-old junior who has a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, anxiety, and oppositional defiant disorder. Do we have a slide on this? I can't remember. No. Okay. No. Okay. Um, 
So he's got a, a bunch of diagnoses and he's been identified as a student with an emotional disturbance under the IDEA. His IEP focuses mainly on his emotional behavioral needs, and he does have a behavior plan as well as services to manage his anxiety and behaviors in school. Now, turning to Jill, Jill is uh, Jack's younger sister. She's 15. She also attends the, uh, the Pleasantville as a freshman. She also has a diagnosis of ADHD. She takes medication for that ADHD at home and at school. She does not have a, uh, a an, an identification under the IDEA, but she has been identified as a student protected by Section 504, and she has a 504 plan with accommodations like extended time and preferential seating. In middle school, she was suspended a few times for behaviors like disrupting class, tardiness, and cutting classes, and she has been exhibiting some similar behaviors at home and at school, but you know, similar inappropriate behaviors at home and at school. So here's what happened. Jill was caught trying to sell her ADHD medication to another student while at school, and in the middle of that sale, she sent a text message to her brother to tell him <clears throat> that the person who was buying the drugs was giving her a hard time about asking about the asking price. And when he got that text message, Jack became agitated and he tried to leave the classroom. And then the teacher, you know, didn't allow him to leave. He, she stepped in front of him and told him that, you know, he had to stay in the classroom. And Jack responded by punching, excuse me, punching the teacher in the face. He broke her glasses and cut her face. And Jack then was received a suspension for assault. He was recommended for expulsion for 80 days. And Jill was suspended for possession and sale of the use of an illegal substance, and she was recommended for an 80-day expulsion. So you can imagine this parent is a little stressed out. So um, we already introduced our, our thespians. Um, and for those thespians who have a copy of the script, know that I will likely not read everything word for word. In the interest of time, I'm going to ad lib and move faster, hopefully to get everybody out. All right, we will start with scene one. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Principal Rooney. Uh, we need to talk about Jack's assault on one of our teachers on the Friday before spring break, which was three weeks ago. Right, Mr. Rooney, we're here today to do a manifestation determination. So to help us along, I've made copies of the manifestation determination worksheet so that we can all follow along as we go through the meeting. Wait, I, I'm confused. What's a manifestation determination? I thought we already had this meeting when I met with a principal and superintendent before Jack was expelled. So this is a process what, that we go through to examine the relationship between Jack's mis misconduct and his disability. The team is charged with considering whether Jack's behavior was actually caused or had a direct relationship to his disability, or if it's a result of the district's failure to implement the IEP. Does that make sense? Yeah, but um, actually, before we get started, there is something I'd like to ask. Um, I know we're here today to talk about Jack, but I'm also really worried about my uh, daughter, Jill. Basically, I just don't think her 504 plan is sufficient. Since the incident that involved Jack also involved Jill, I'm hoping we can talk about both of them today. Would that work? Uh, well, once we get it done in an hour, I'm okay with that. I got an interview scheduled for subs. Oh, um, I didn't realize we had a time limitation. There wasn't one listed on the invitation. All right, well, we're gonna take a break right now and see if we can spot any legal issues to what just happened. So first we're gonna talk about the timing of the manifestation determination. You know, We talked about that the MDR has to be performed within 10 school days of the decision to change placement. And you know, we, I think Principal Rooney said it was you know, several weeks ago. So we probably didn't meet our timeline. And since Jack's been recommended for an ADD expulsion, that would be a change of placement that would trigger having that meeting. Number, issue number two, do we have everybody we need to have at the team meeting? Are all of the relevant members of the team met here? So just as a reminder, the IDEA requires it to be the you know, parent, We've got that, relevant members of the team. And so that in the relevant members of the team would be individuals who might be able to speak to Jack's disability. And so one of the people who 
I might suggest to have here is the um, the school psychologist to talk about the nature of the student's disability and whether or not there was uh, a, a manifestation. And so, even though you see uh, Stephen on the on the line, he didn't endorse, He's not there really in, in yet. He will be. Um, then the issue number three is what about Jill? We've only talked about Jack so far, and we let's quite the question is, do we need to do a manifestation about Jill? Because even though she's not currently on an IEP, she has been identified as a child with a disability under Section 504. And as we talked about earlier, 504 does require you to do an evaluation um, and look at the relationship between the behavior and the disability. Now, remember, I had all of that conversation about when do we do manifestation reviews? For IEP kids and and those uh, the students on IEPs, and that you have ten days and you don't have to do it before, in Section five hundred four world, you do have to do it before. So if you're only dealing with a student who's protected by Section five hundred four, the manifestation review has to be before. How do you remember this? I like golden tickets analogies, you know, kind of stuff like this. Here's a rhyme: Section five hundred four manifestation before. Okay, IDEA, it's, it's later. But Section 504 manifestation before, and we didn't do it here, and so that's a problem. All right, and then lastly, the time limit on meetings. <clears throat> you know, Rooney is saying, I, I've got to get out of here. I've got to go get, some, you know, find some more subs. And the parent is saying, I didn't know that there was a time limit on the meeting. Do yourself a favor. And when you're issuing your IEP invitations, put a beginning and ending time on the, on the invitation. It, it has everybody with a shared understanding of how much time is allotted, because maybe... Maybe, you know, Ms. Simpson is thinking we're going to be here for about five hours because I needed a lot of stuff to talk about. And if, if initially at the outset, somebody's saying it's only going to be an hour, that's already putting starting things on a, on, a, on a difficult front. All right. So let's see how Ms. Moneypenny handles all of these issues. So I think we can make this work. First, let's start with Jack and do the manifestation determination on his assault charge. Then we'll turn to Jill and do the MDR on her drug charge. Are you kidding me? Jill gets a manifestation determination too. She's just got a 504 plan, not even an IEP. And she's dealing drugs in my school. Mr. Rooney, she is identified as a student with a disability under Section 504. And that means before we can do a significant change of placement, and we would consider a removal for 80 days to be a significant change of placement, the law requires us to do a quote unquote evaluation, which is why we need to do the manifestation review. Basically, we can't put Jill out for conduct related to her disability. So we have to look at doing a manifestation review, not only for Jack, who's identified on an IEP, but also for Jill under her section 504 plan. With that in mind, Mrs. Simpson, are you all right with moving forward with both reviews today? Uh, yeah, that'd be fine. Okay, great. I know, Sorry, I know we've had this meeting scheduled for only one hour, but because I want to make sure we have enough time to discuss both students, can we please make sure we can make arrangements to stay beyond the original hour scheduled if we need to? Yes, I can. I can stay. Me too. Uh, I can't. I've got interviews scheduled this afternoon. Okay, well, I think for Jack's manifestation review, we have all of the relevant members of the IEP team. We have Ms. Ice, who's the special education teacher. We have Ms. Smiley, his regular education teacher. I'm serving as the district representative. However, we do seem to be missing Mr. Basque, our school psychologist. Um, they'd be able to help us understand things related to the disability. Do we think we might wanna call them in? They'd be relevant for the discussion. She's actually conducting interviews of those subs right now. Well, I think we may need to relieve her of that duty and ask her to join the meeting, especially for Jill's portion. Wasn't she the primary witness to Jill's drug offense? Ugh, they're crying out loud. Uh, you know what? I'll just go cancel the next round of interviews so both of us can be here for, for, for these meetings. That's fine. All right, well, let's take another break to see what just happened. First of all, um, our school psychologist is gender fluid. So just, you know, putting it out there, <laughs> you might, different pronouns are going to be used. Um, so the role of the district rep, um, you have Ms. Moneypenny. Here is, you know, somebody who's been an experienced special ed director. And, you know, while, the, while we would all love to be in IEP meetings where nobody says things that are triggering to other people, 
<clears throat> and that, you know, people make sometimes comments that are inflammatory or insensitive. That's often not what happens. And, you know, you may preview, spoiler alert, Mr. Rooney might be the type of administrator who makes those type of remarks. So it's important for you, if you're serving as a district representative, to be, remain cool and focused and ensure that, you know, we're following the re legal requirements and we're working to tone down and diffuse any, any you know, unfortunate comments. So Ms. Moneypenny is trying to def you know, keep Mr. Rooney in check and make sure that the parent is, is able to meaningfully participate and understands the purpose of the process. All right, and, and as part of that process is it, who can conduct this manifestation review. So, you know, it would be similar to what we're doing in for the student who is on an IEP. The determination about whether a student's misconduct is related to the disability is really the same group of individuals who is knowledgeable about the student and also the meaning of the, the evaluation data. So, you know, parent, the same group of people who probably identified the, this uh, Jill as a child with a disability. So given these standards, it's probably good that Ms. Moneypenny is, has requested the participation of the school psychologist. So let's go back to the meeting and see what happens next. Sorry, Mrs. Simpson, are you all right having these people present for both of the manifestation reviews? Uh, yeah, that, that's fine. All right, now with all this legal mumbo jumbo out of the way, can we get started with determining whether or not these delinquents are guilty? The school has a zero tolerance policy for drugs and violence and students who violate it are expelled. Mr. Rooney, the purpose of a manifestation review is not to decide guilt or innocence. While you are right that the district does have a zero tolerance policy for serious offenses such as these, our purpose here today is to decide whether or not Jack or Jill's conduct is a manifestation of their disabilities. Whatever, let's just get started. Ms. Ice, can you tell us what happened when Jack slugged you? Well, he didn't actually hit me. I was out sick that day. You know that intervention specialist substitute who models eyeglasses on the side? She's the one who got hit. He knocked her in the face, shattered her glasses, and cut her pretty severely. I saw the substitute right after the incident, and she was bleeding, and she had a gash on her cheek from the eyeglasses. Miss Moneypenny, I understand we have to go through this touchy-feely manifestation process, but when a kid physically assaults and causes physical damage to someone, can't we just put the punk out of school? Well, why don't we hear the whole story before we jump to any conclusions? Ms. Ice, were you done reporting on the incident? Oh, I got a lot more. The substitute teacher was pretty mad. She left me two pages, single-spaced, typed incident report on it. I brought some extra copies if anyone wants to see it. All righty then, now we're getting somewhere. What does the write-up say? It says that Jack was sitting near the front of the classroom and she thinks she hears a beep. She turned to look where the sound was coming from and she catches Jack staring down at his pants, which she thought was really weird. She writes that he starts squirming and rocking in his seat, so she thinks maybe he's sick or he needs to use the restroom. So she actually goes up to him and asks if he needs to go to the bathroom. He says no, and then he yells at her to stop being so nosy. Then Jack gets up and heads toward the classroom door, and he says that he needs to go down the hall. So it looks like she steps in front of him and asks him to tell her what was wrong, and he starts to pace back and forth near the door, um, breathing really heavily. She asks him to sit down and try to calm down, and he starts yelling that he needs to leave now and get out there. The teacher was worried that Jack was hallucinating, so she asks him where out there is. At that point, it looks like he lunged at her out of nowhere and punched her square in the nose. That's when her eyeglasses shattered and he bolted out of the classroom. She says, and I quote, he is hysterical and totally out of control. She goes on to describe some other details about how he dealt with the, her injury, but that's pretty much it. You know what? I think that teacher deserved to be punched. Jeez, lady, no wonder your kids are in trouble. Why would you say she deserved to be punched? Because she didn't follow Jack's behavior plan at all. The plan says that when he gets agitated in the classroom, when he starts to squirm or to pace or to breathe deeply, he's supposed to be allowed to leave the classroom to go see his counselor to work on calming strategies. In fact, when we had the meeting where we developed that plan, we even came up with a code phrase for him to use when he needed to go to see his counselor so his classmates didn't have to know where he was going. The code phrase was, I need to go down the hall, and that is exactly what he said. 
But instead of letting him go, the teacher blocked the doorway and just agitated him more. Ms. Ice, did you happen to bring a copy of Jack's IEP and behavior plan with you today? I have cop copies of both right here. And another question, Ms. Ice. Did you happen to leave a copy of Jack's IEP and behavior plan in your substitute teaching file? I certainly hope you didn't. I would never leave a student's IEP and behavior plan in my sub file. Those are highly confidential documents and I would never want a substitute to see those. Oh, I totally agree. I would never put that in my substitute file. I only keep my lesson plans in there. All right, then. We obviously do need to discuss what goes in a substitute teaching file. All right. So as a little break, Let's talk about what has to be reviewed at a manifestation review meeting. You have to review all of the relevant information in the child's file um, and any relevant information provided by the parents. So the team not only has to review the substitute teacher's notes, which you know detailed what happened, but also has to carefully review Jack's IEP, which in case would include the behavior plan. The next issue is, you know, there's a direct and substantial relationship or failure to, to implement. So when you're looking at manifestation reviews, you're not only looking at did the student's conduct, was the student's conduct a manifestation of the child's disability? You're also looking at did the district fail to implement the IEP and it was that failure to implement what caused the conduct? So in this case, the, the, the team must consider, you know, the relationship between Jack's disability and his conduct and was the conduct caused by the failure to implement the behavior plan that allowed Jack to remove himself from the classroom when he was agitated. Next one is confidentiality. So my uh, my character says, uh, you know, I would never put a, uh, an, a the, the uh, behavior plan in a, in a sub file. That's, those are highly confidential documents. Well, no, as you probably remember from our prior session on confidentiality, maybe it's the next session, I'm not sure. If you're in the whole series, you will hear about this. IEPs are student records that are protected by FERPA, so they're generally protected for release unless you meet one of the exceptions. And, you know, one of the exceptions is somebody who has to implement the IEP. That would be an individual with a legitimate educational interest. So disclosure of an IEP to a substitute teacher who would be responsible for implementing that IEP falls under the exception and would be permissible. And then issue 10, handling parental fr frustration. Um, you know, often there are difficult exchanges during IEP meetings. I think members of my team can attest to the fact that we only get invited to the IEP meetings where there are difficult exchanges. Otherwise, you're probably not having lawyers there. But, you know, so we're pretty, we're pretty comfortable when there's, you know, frustration or people being upset. But you know that there's a risk during any meeting that participants might get angry and upset. Um, and so as Ms. Money Penny will do and has done, just be prepared to acknowledge and address the emotions so that the team doesn't get stuck in them. Um, I also had a, an, a question that came up in the chat while we were acting. Does the school psych have to be at the manifestation review meeting? It seems like a good, it seems good, but is it required? It is not legally required is not legally required. However, when you think about it is relevant members of the IEP team and that you have to look at the examine the relationship between the student's behavior and their disability, you know, if you're getting into what is the nature of the student's disability and how does that disability present itself in that particular student, the person who evaluated the student or the person who has knowledge about this disability would, you know, could be somebody who is relevant to that exchange. So again, not legally required, but you, I think there's can be some, you, know, you can construe the uh, requirement in a couple of different places. In addition, if the parents or somebody else brings assessment data to the manifestation review, remember your IEP team requires you to have somebody who can interpret the instructional implications of assessment results as part of your team. So the answer to the question is it depends, which is always the lawyer answer. All right, scene four. I understand that this is a very difficult and frustrating conversation for everyone at the table, but I want to assure you that we're here to determine what is appropriate for Jack. Hey, look, I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that earlier. Of course, that substitute didn't deserve to be hit. Jack's such a strong boy, and I know he can be really scary when he gets in one of his moods. I'm just angry because I think this whole thing could have been avoided. I do think that what happened was because of his disability. 
everything in that teacher's report and everything Jack told me about it convinces me that he was agitated and needed to step out, but the teacher blocks a doorway and his ODD just kicked in. I agree. The confrontation by the substitute teacher would just exacerbate the behavior of an agitated student with a diagnosis of ODD. Is there any disagreement on this point among the team members? No. All right. Well, we are also charged with looking at whether there was a failure to implement Jack's IEP. Okay. Maybe it was a problem. I think I have to agree. The behavior plan just wasn't followed. I would agree. Well, then it looks like we have consensus here. I do want to mention at this point for the benefit of all of our teachers, since we have so many substitutes in this district, the FERPA regulations do permit us to disclose personally identifiable information to people who have a legitimate educational interest in knowing that information. Certainly the substitute teachers who will be implementing the IEPs and behavior plans in your absence have a legitimate interest in knowing what's in those IEPs and the behavior plans. If you're sure, then I'll add them to my subfolders. I'm very sure. Me too. Really, what difference does any of this make? Why does it matter if it's because of his disability or because we failed to implement a behavior plan? He caused serious bodily injury to that eyeglass model. You know, I've heard that if a student causes serious bodily injury, the district can place them in a disciplinary placement for up to 45 school days, regardless of whether it's related to the disability or not. Sure. Wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute, you're telling me that if the misconduct was a direct result of his disability and your employee failed to implement his behavior plan, you can still discipline him for it? Sure we can, that's why it's zero tolerance. Sounds like zero common sense to me. All right, time for another break. So <clears throat> the special circumstances, this is where we got into our last question in our, in our um, four question analysis. Mr. Rooney is right, for once, um, that there are special circumstances involving safety when, a, when school personnel can remove a child to this interim alternative educational setting without regard to whether or not the behavior was a manifestation of the disability. So you will remember that these special circumstances involve drugs, weapons, or serious bodily injury. So here we're going to have to look at the serious bodily injury element, and we'll see how the team resolves that question. Well, Mr. Basque is right that there is special circumstances exception that applies if the issue involves school safety. It applies when there's a weapons violation, drugs, or as Mr. Rooney was referencing earlier, serious bodily injury. But in this case, I really think we need to take a look at the definition of serious bodily injury. Serious bodily injury has been defined as bodily injury, which involves a substantial risk of death, extreme physical pain, protracted and obvious disfigurement, or a protracted loss or impairment of the function of a bodily member, organ, or mental faculty. It is very serious. And I'm not sure that punching a substitute in the nose, even when it draws blood, and even though the substitute is actually an eyeglasses model, would constitute serious bodily injury in this case. It doesn't sound like it. Good grief, are we still in America? The kid smashes a teacher in the face and we can't discipline him? No, Mr. Rooney, in this case, we cannot. In fact, Mrs. Simpson, the law requires that we return Jack back to school. Oh, thank goodness. Additionally, the law requires that when the team concludes that the misconduct was a manifestation of his disability, that we either conduct a functional behavior assessment or create a behavior plan. Or when the behavior plan's already in place, as it is here, the team has to take a look at the behavior plan and see if it needs to be amended or modified in any way to address the actual conduct. I don't actually think Jack's behavior plan needs to be modified. He's been doing really well in my class, making sure that he's communicating when he needs to leave the classroom and go see the counselor. I think the problem was that the substitute couldn't implement the plan because she didn't know how it existed. Yes, I agree to a point. In this case, do we know whether Jack was asking to self-remove because he was really agitated or just because he got a text message from his sister? Well, I think the text did agitate him. It would upset anyone to know their little sister was in trouble. Or that she was causing trouble. Well, I agree with Ms. Simpson that the written report of the substitute indicates that he was truly agitated. She indicated in the report that he was pacing and breathing rapidly, and those are classic signs of anxiety. 
All right, well, it sounds like the behavior plan is fine. And we've noted that it will be brought to the attention of any future substitutes that will be in the classroom. Mrs. Simpson, Jack may return to his classes immediately. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. All right, so what just happened here? Um, what, what do we think is next for Jack? So the teams determined that his behavior was a manifestation of his disability and, you know, a, in this case, a functional behavior assessment isn't needed. He already has a behavior plan that, you know, doesn't need to be modified. So the only thing left for the team to do is return him to his regular placement. If the district really wanted to pursue a change of placement over Ms. Simpson's objection, they could go and seek a hearing, go through a due process proceeding or seek a court order. But it doesn't appear to be the case here because, you know, it's really difficult for the district to say, we're going to, you know, we're going to take that action when in fact this action is in response to behavior that was caused by our failure to implement the, the behavior plan. So it all kind of comes back to the district's conduct. Let's turn back to the scene and see how the team considers Jill's involvement in the incident. All right, let's move on to Jill. Since Jill is on a 504 plan and she's not receiving any actual special education, is it all right if we excuse Ms. Ice, our special education teacher, from the meeting at this point? Sure. I don't know that she has anything to add about Jill. Thanks. Now, as I said earlier, Section 504 requires before imposing discipline that a team of knowledgeable persons convene a team meeting and do an evaluation. Part of that evaluation is to determine whether the conduct is related to that student's disability. If the conduct is actually related to the disability, then the Office for Civil Rights tells us that we have to do a complete evaluation of that student to determine if their placement is appropriate. If it's not related to the disability, then we may impose discipline on her just as we would any other general education student. I don't know if this is the right time to bring this up, but in addition to this manifestation determination, I'd also like to talk about Jill's behavior in general, which I'm getting more and more worried about. I think she's just been moody and withdrawn lately. And as you know, she's had uh, quite a few disciplinary reports over the last few years. And, um, you know, for things like not following the rules, being disrespectful, sleeping in class. In fact, uh, Mrs. Smiley and I have discussed and exchanged some emails about whether Jill might need special ed like Jack. I'm just concerned because she's emotionally, that she might be emotionally troubled like her brother and you may need uh, to be giving her more intense supports in school. Nope, oh, that's my line. <laughs> yes, you're right, Ms. Simpson. We we have caught, talked quite a bit about your concerns as well as mine that Jill might need extra support as she advances in school and that the demands on her increase. You know, I've known her for several years and I've noticed an increasing number of disciplinary infractions, but it, it just doesn't seem to be any pattern. They all seem to be for different things. Look, everyone can use more support in school, but it's no mystery that Jill is a teenage girl. Random trouble is expected with teenagers. Adolescence is not a disability. If it were, the entire high school body would have IEPs. Look, you know, I, I understand that to some extent, but as you know, I have two other children in addition to Jill and Jack, and Jill, like Jack, is different. In fact, I recently had Jill evaluated by Jack's psychiatrist, Dr. Doolittle, and I have a copy of her report. It shows new diagnoses for Jill, depression and a mood disorder. It also has several new educational recommendations for her. Okay, that's nice. We can look at it another time, but I'm getting annoyed that we keep getting off the topic here, which is whether or not we can discipline this student for selling her medication to another student. I won't have a drug pusher in my school. Stephen, you're muted. Sorry, may I see a copy of the report? Thank you. You know, that's a really good idea. Why don't we take a break now and so we can review this, this new psychiatric report? All right, so they're going to take a break and we'll do some more issue spotting. So, you know, the first question is, you know, Jill is entitled to disciplinary protections of the IDEA. We already said she's entitled to disciplinary protections, meaning the manifestation process under Section 504. But here we've got a situation where Jill might have the golden ticket. In addition to being identified under Section 504, the school district had knowledge that the student was a child with a disability before the behavior. So you'll recall that the district is considered to have knowledge when the child has a suspected disability where you know, the parent has expressed concern in writing to Jill's teacher that Jill may be in need of special education and related service. So the district did have knowledge that Jill had the golden ticket. So even if Jill wasn't identified 
under Section 504 as a child with a disability, she would fall under question number two. She would be a child who is a suspected disabled student for purposes of discipline. Next issue is Dr. Doolittle's private evaluation. Does the team have to consider it? So as I mentioned earlier, the, the regulation that governs manifestation reviews states that the team has to consider all relevant information in the student's file and information that the, the parent provides, which is going to include that report. So the, the Ms. Moneypenny is right to, or smart to start stop the meeting and allow all of the participants to carefully review the document. Many times um, the, the teams are just like do a cursory review or like leave the report on the table without team members considering it. And you know, keep in mind that the obligation is to consider it, not necessarily follow it, but you actually have to consider it. So let's return to the meeting and see what happens next. So now that we've reviewed Dr. Doolittle's report, let's return to the NDR. Given what you and Ms. Smiley have shared with the team, I think we as a district probably need to consider Jill as a suspected disabled student under the IDEA. In fact, that's why we've asked Ms. Ice to return to the meeting. It appears that you've expressed concern in writing to her regular education teacher that she may need some special education supports. Again, why does it matter whether she's suspected? disabled under the IDEA. We're already doing the manifestation determination under Section 504. The difference comes about in the forms and the procedures that we use. Also, there's a difference if the team determines that Jill's misconduct is not a manifestation of her disability and imposes discipline, which constitutes a change in placement, meaning more than 10 days, because Jill would be entitled to services starting on day 11. It seems to me there's no way that Jill can be disciplined for having sold her ADHD medication. That's clearly an impulsive act, and so it was tied to her ADHD. Mrs. Simpson, do you know if Jill took her medication that day? Oh, yes, for sure. I give it to her every day. 15 milligrams of Adderall in the morning, and then she takes it again later at school. I reviewed the medication, medication log, and she did take her medication that day. I think it's important to remember that not only does Jill have a diagnosis of ADHD, but according to Dr. Doolittle, she now also has a diagnosis of a mood disorder and depression. Okay, that's a really good reminder for the team. Let's take a minute to look at the conduct. Ms. Smiley, do you have any reason to believe that Jill's Section 504 plan wasn't being followed? No, actually, she just left my class for extended time on her science test when the incident happened. I don't have any reason to think it wasn't being followed either. Okay, that's good to know. Mr. Basque, I understand that you were an eyewitness to the event. Yes, I was. Can you share what you know with the team? Yes, I can. I was in the hallway administering an assessment to another student when Jill came around the corner and met a boy in the hallway. They were about 25 feet from where I was working with the other student. The acoustics in the hallway are very good, so I could hear everything they were saying. The boy asked Jill if she had taken care of what they had talked about yesterday and Jill replied that she had taken care of it because she needs money for a new phone. Jill also added that she had done this so many times that she almost has enough money for the phone. At that point, Jill's back was to me so I could see she was getting something out of her pocket, the pocket of her jeans, but I couldn't see what it was. And the boy said to Jill, I thought you said Ritalin. And Jill whispered, no, Adderall. The boy said five and Jill said 10. And the boy said, that is too much and not what you told me yesterday and I'm going to rat you out to Rooney. The boy then left the hallway and went into the restroom. At that point, Jill got very nervous and I could see she was getting something out of her pocket and she started pushing buttons on her cell phone very rapidly. I asked the student who I was working with to stay where they were and I went to the nearest classroom and asked the teacher to call Mr. Rooney. When I came back to the hallway, I saw Jill and the boy talking again. The boy handed her $10 and Jill took a plastic bag and handed it to him. Mr. Rooney came around the corner and they both tried to run from him, but he was able to catch up. At first, they both told me they were staying in the hallway talking about phones. When I asked them why they'd run, they just shrugged. So I asked the boy to open his hand and he had a plastic bag with a 15 milligram Adderall pill in it. He pointed at Jill and said, she gave it to me. So I took them both down to the office and started the disciplinary paperwork. He gave me a statement that pretty much tracks with what Mr. Bass says, and Jill refused to talk to me. There was nothing that I witnessed that would suggest Jill was selling her Adderall because she was depressed or had a mood disorder. Sure, but she was acting impulsively. She obviously couldn't control herself or think before she acted. Why else would she sell medication with, a 20, with an adult 25 feet away? 
I think it was foolish, but I don't think she was impulsive. It was clear from what I overheard the students had planned to meet in the hallway ahead of that time that they had even talked about the price of how much the drugs would cost. So this was clearly a planned behavior, not impulsive. Could not agree more. I agree as well. It doesn't seem like the action of a kid who's acting impulsively. I think that's correct. It appears that Jill's conduct is not related to her disability. It appears we have consensus among the team. No, we don't. I don't agree. Don't you think that with all these new diagnoses that Jill might be just like her brother? Seems to me like this district should evaluate her before this decision is finalized. Oh, good grief. What kind of evaluation is going to tell us it's okay to sell drugs in school? Besides that, it takes months to do one of those evaluations, and we're almost the end of the school year. Our school psychologist doesn't work during the summer. All right, we're going to take a break to see, to spot some more issues and let the team members calm down. So let's discuss Ms. Simpson's request for an evaluation. So the district is treating Jill as if she were a student with a disability under the IDEA. So an evaluation would certainly be appropriate at this point, and the district would have to conduct that evaluation in an expedited manner. And despite what Mr. Rooney said, the summer break does not stop the evaluation timeline, and the district will have to make arrangements to conduct an expedited evaluation over the summer. And then next, we've got a disagreement. So here, the team is not going to come to agreement on the issue of whether Jill's conduct is a manifestation of her disability. So who has the decision-making authority when there's a lack of agreement among team members? And here, it is the district rep. So Miss Money Penny makes the decision. And let's see how she handles it. Mrs. Simpson, you have the right to request an evaluation. And given what's been discussed here today, I do believe that a referral for an IDEA evaluation for Jill is appropriate. We can convene an ETR planning meeting and start that ball rolling and keep that ball rolling, Mr. Rooney, even over the summer if necessary. Since that evaluation has been requested in the context of discipline, you are entitled to an expedited evaluation and we may be able to get that done before summer break arrives. Thanks, but I'm still confused. Does that mean that Jill will be able to come back to school or that she'll be out until the evaluation is completed? Actually, it does not mean that Jill will be able to come back to school. The IDEA provides that when a student is put out for disciplinary reasons not, not related to their disability and not due to failure to implement the IEP or behavior plan, they can be out on their suspension or their expulsion without educational services for up to 10 days. Now, in this case, because we are treating her as a student identified under IDEA, she will, of course, get services after day 11. How can this be? I am part of this team and I just told you that I disagree that her conduct was not related to her disability. I thought that this was a team decision and we all had to reach it by consensus and I definitely don't agree. When there's a lack of consensus among the team members, the district representative is charged with making the final determination. And everything I've heard here today suggests that Jill's conduct was not impulsive nor related to her disability. It wasn't related to her ADHD or her depression or anything else that we've considered here today. Jill's conduct was purposeful, deliberate, and planned. I will note your disagreement in a written notice that we will provide to you outlining the decisions made here today, and that will be accompanied with a booklet that describes your procedural rights, including your ability to file for an expedited due process hearing to challenge the decision. Wait, what does expedited mean? Does it mean that Jill will be out of school until that hearing is done? Yes, that's right. Jill would be out of school during the time that the hearing occurs. Expedited means the hearing is held within 20 school days and the decision is issued by a hearing officer within the 10 days following that. Look, I really do not want Jill out of school. I am gonna take this school district to court and I am gonna win. Why would we need to fight about whether the drug transaction is a manifestation of a disability? I thought that under the special circumstances that we discussed earlier, that we could put the student out for 45 days if she sold or possessed drugs at school, regardless of the determination. You're not claiming that she didn't possess or sell the Adderall, right? No, but I do think that her conduct is a manifestation of her disability and so she shouldn't be punished. Well, in this circumstance, Mr. Rooney is actually correct. Wow, I got one right. Regardless of the outcome of the manifestation determination, the district is permitted to proceed with a disciplinary removal of Jill for up to 45 days because this incident did involve the sale and possession of a controlled substance. But Jill has been expelled for 80 days. Yeah, that's right. And I don't think that she should be out for even 45 days. Plus, Mrs. Smiley knows that I've been concerned about Jill's behavior 
spiraling out of control for a while. If the district had noticed that, maybe something more could have been done for her and we wouldn't be in this mess in the first place. That's why I had her evaluated by Dr. Doolittle. Ms. Simpson, I understand that you're upset, but the facts here today suggest that Jill's conduct was not a function of her disability. It was a function of the fact that she wanted a new phone. It appears that the discipline may be imposed for 45 days, and during that time, Jill will be placed in an IAES. The district will, of course, go forward with the expedited evaluation. What is an IAES? Why do you guys always talk in code? What about ODD and ADHD? Why don't we just say that what this student did was just plain old BAD? All right, everyone, I agree. Let's speak English. An IAES is an interim alternative educational setting. It's an option available to the district for delivering services to a student during a disciplinary removal. It's a place where Jill can continue to work on her education program while discipline is being imposed. So who decides what this IAES is? Well, there's not much to decide. It's home instruction. That's what we do for every student in the district assigned to IAES. It's five hours of home instruction a week. All right, well, let's take a break to, to spot our final issues. So what we've been studying is what procedures and protections exist for students with identified disabilities. But, you know, it's equally important to remember the things that we talked about before at the very beginning of the talk today, those, those requirements that apply to all students. So all students have discipline protections. And when students with disabilities go through this process, they are also entitled to the disciplinary protections that exist for all kids, like the notice, the opportunity to respond, the hearing. So um, the next is the IAES determination, so that interim setting. So since Jill's expulsion would result in a change of placement, the, the setting is going to be determined by the full team. If the district, if the, the removal didn't constitute a change of placement, the services that Jill would receive after day 11 or on day 11 would be determined by the district in consultation with one of Jill's teachers. But here it's the team and not Mr. Rooney alone under that five days, his five days theory that's going to determine the interim alternative setting. It's an individualized determination. So that's the next point that you can't have one size fits all conclusion. So you can't say that all kids get five hours a week. <clears throat> it's not that that is there's not a rule for that. The rule is that you have to make an individualized determination as to what Jill would require. So and 20, the last the last point I want to make is number 20, which is the importance of compromise. And we got to highlight that it is necessary to, sometimes to really be looking at who are the best people to have effective communication skills, at, who are the best people who are going to be active listeners, who will consider all view, viewpoints. And Ms. Moneypenny brings that to the table. Um, and she's able to, you know, steer the, the conversation and not get into the rabbit hole of uh, people who are angry. So let's see, let's return to the meeting to, well, actually, we're not returning to the meeting. I'm going to just tell you in the interest of time. So mom disagrees with the interim alternative setting of home school, home instruction for Jill. Ms. Moneypenny then talks about a nearby alternative school. And Ms. Simpson said, you know, that's going to work for her. It's close by. She believes Jill will continue to receive educational services, and that would be better for her than just being at home. And then the meeting ends with consensus and, you know, a, you know, a, a positive outcome. Let me see. There are two questions, I think. One of the questions I believe we answered, can the parent appeal the manifestation determination? Yes, that goes through an expedited due process. If the school is unable to provide services to a severe student who's having a diagnosis, and is suspected of having a disability but not having the parent consent yet, what is the procedure to follow? I'm not if I'm not sure I understand that question. If whoever asked that question wants to go off mute and, and ask it. Wait a second. In the meet. I think they're saying that the district is on notice. They suspect the student of a disability, but they have not obtained the parent's consent for evaluation yet. Oh, okay. So yeah, the, so when you're looking at the manifestation review of a suspected disabled student, it is often difficult because you don't have a lot of data. You just, the, I mean, my only advice is that you do the best you can and looking at what information does the team have about the student's needs coming from the district members of you know of the of the team. So what in, what what work samples have we created? What anecdotal records? What information do we know about the student's um, disability or not disability or be or level of behavior control? 
All right. Well, you know, our volunteer thespians, I just want to thank everybody. Um, I know we have Stephen and Aaron who are educators, but just FYI, Isaac and Aaron, members of the Bricker and Eckler legal team are also former educators having been in the classroom. So they know what it is. And so I think for both of them, you both get the volunteer thespian Academy Award. We will split it down the middle for the two of you. Um, the, the the green monster, but um, they 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 bring a lot to the table because they've been in the classroom, um, and so I appreciate you guys volunteering today and for um, acting it up and hamming it up for our audience. All right, well, Laura, can you answer? It looks like in Aisha's message there is a second part to that question. I just wanted to clarify with her that it is not the family's responsibility to find the alternative placement. No, correct. No. That's correct. The district is finding the, uh, the alternative program. And those are another one. Yep, I think we got them all. Did I miss any? Nope, all right. All right, so as I do on some, sometimes, I write some poetry that is related to education and special education. And so just like the last time I have some special education poems, but they're really just nursery rhymes for special education. So here we go, just to end the day. Jack and Jill went up the hill to get in a marijuana haze. Jack came down and pot was found and he was removed for 45 school days. Georgie Porgy putting in pie kissed the girls and made them cry. A behavior plan was put in play with replacement behaviors taught each day. Now when Georgie sees a girl arrive, he greets her with a simple high five. Mary, Mary, quite contrary, some say she's ODD. She refuses to comply, she makes teachers cry, and she was diagnosed with ADHD. When she stole a phone she did not own, everyone claimed there was premeditation. So the team convened and her mother screamed, of course, it's a manifestation. Little Jan Corner sat in a corner. He needed a sensory break. That's all I have on that one. Jack be nimble, Jack be quick. Jack stabbed his aide with a toothpick. The team convened but couldn't agree if the pick was a weapon or caused serious bodily injury. And the last one is five little monkeys jumping on the bed. One fell off and bumped his head. The mother called the doctor and the doctor said, what is the function of that behavior? That's all I've got for you. I'll be playing New York City this weekend. No, I'm just kidding. Um, thank you guys so much for coming back, for your attention, for your questions. Um, and also, if you can, please indulge us in a little bit of feedback. Um, we are, we are, we continue to repeat the series over and over and over again um, because people ask us to. Um, and so, if there's any additions, uh, subtractions, adjustments that you think need to be made, if we do the series again, um, that feedback is much appreciated. Hey, Laura, you got one uh, last question here. Um, is the district legally bound to provide home instruction in that case or maybe in good faith? Um, I'm not sure in which case. So the district has to provide interim alternative educational services. And if that's relating to the, the scenario where they can't find somebody, somebody or they don't know where to find those services, the answer is yes. You are, the district is legally and financially responsible for those to, for providing the services. All right, take care guys. See you next time. Yeah, thank you very much um, to Laura and her crew over at Bricker and Eckler. Just a reminder, the survey will be in is in the email that um, Ann Slane sent originally with the link, registration link. Our next installment of this will be on February 10th, um, and that will be on confidentiality and procedural safeguards. So please register for that in STARS, and we will see you then. We hope you all have a good weekend and I'm sure we will see most of you soon. All right, thanks, Steve.